Happy New Year! Ooh, doesn't it feel good to get into 2021 to flick away that little zero at the end of 2020 and replace it with a one? It's so good. This is going to be an incredible year. And we are here at the Breakthrough Creative where we talk about the business of art and art of business. I'm your host, John McDavitt, and I want to get right into today's episode that revisits our friend Jim Joswiak, who uh, was in episode 31, which was 10 episodes ago, and he shared about his business, Band for Today, that provides uh, band instruction to schools that either can't afford a band program or uh, just don't know what to do with it at, at a private school. So he found this niche and he filled it and has been incredibly successful with it. And something that I know about Jim is, is that he uses coaching and something called a mastermind. I don't know if you're all familiar with masterminds. I wasn't up until a few years ago, but it's kind of like a, a, a business support group that can involve coaching, but uh, coaching and masterminds are are two examples of ways to really accelerate your growth in your business. And so with that, let me hand it off to me and Jim. So who is the coach that you've referred to uh, throughout our interview? His name is Sam Beckford. Now he's in, he's in Vancouver, British Columbia. So what led you to seek out a coach? And when did you get a coach? Um, Sam markets all over the country and his expertise is in uh, music studios, music dance and, and, and music studios. So we would get his postcards all the time and it's, everybody laughs about it now, but you know, you look at a postcard and he says, I can double your revenue. I can do this. We have a successful place for many years. And uh, so Leah was getting it because she had a music studio, my wife. And so she said, we should, we should go to one of these. We should check it out. And I was looking and I said, okay, let's go check it out. And in those days, Sam would do two conferences a year in different parts of the country. So one, he might be in Chicago one year, New York, Philadelphia, whatever. So you would fly and they were fairly big. You'd be in a big ballroom, um, two or 300 studio owners would fly in front of the country and he would do a two day seminar. And, uh, so Sam and I have really, really similar personalities and I like Sam a lot. And most importantly, I trust him. There's a lot of scammy coaches and there's a lot of bad coaching out there, bad at what they do systems. And they're, they're really expensive and there's everybody in the world has a thing like that now. So, so once we went, we learned a lot and Sam was really good. And most importantly, one of the coolest things was that you, as an entrepreneur, you're alone a lot. You're generally alone. You don't have somebody to give you advice, somebody to help you, especially when you're young and you're growing your company. It's like, was this the right marketing decision? Was, was were any of the thousands of decisions I made right? There's nobody who's going to stand here and come into my office and say, oh, no, Jim, that was the wrong decision. You, you, you know, so when I've told some entrepreneurs that I work with about that, one woman started crying. Is, you know, she was struggling and I said, you know, one of the biggest things about this is you're making all these decisions and you're alone. And she started crying and I didn't mean to make her cry, but it was, you know, you're laying in bed trying to make that payroll or, or your rent's coming due. No, no one, no, no one is, what was the phrase I used? Um, no one is coming. So to come back to Sam's thing is, is now I'm sitting at a table with 10 other entrepreneurs, owners that are in, now I didn't have a music studio. I didn't have a business that was like my wife's, but it was close enough. And obviously there was a lot of learning going on. So now you've got all these entrepreneurs at the table and we're not in competition with each other because they're from all over the country, you know, and Sam has a thing with a lot of conferences do where you can block people. Like if you're in a certain zip code, if you're in the gold plus program, you can block these five competitors around you. Because what's the use of going to a conference and learning from a guy if, if your competitor is sitting at the next table, right? So now we had all these great entrepreneurs and we could say, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I've got this new program here and I've got this. What are you charging for that? Where are you finding teachers? Or what, what's your, you know, how is the schedule looking? And these are people that are in your industry that can 
and they were cool and we would learn. So not only were we learning from Sam, but the amount of information of the people and every session you try to sit at a different table because there were other people that were good. And now, uh, and so the learning curve is astronomical. Um, and what happens then is you become friends with a lot of those people, the ones that you're compatible with, the ones that are successful. And um, we ended up starting a mastermind group here in the Midwest with about five or six really good entrepreneurs that, that we'd met at Sam's conference. And so, um, again, the amount of growth and learning, you know, now you've got all these people that are contributing to your growth and ideas. So before we get into masterminds, so what does it take, do you think, for someone to realize they need a coach and then to take that next step to go find a coach and then to, to sit at the feet of that coach and really take it all in? Yeah. Um, you know, that it's a really good question in in a lot of ways. So to be learnable, teachable, learnable, uh, you know, to be wanting to learn. First of all, that's onto you and your personality. There's some people that you can't get through no matter what. They're, they just don't, they got, they're set in their ways or they're not, their life isn't built on learning and education and trying to get better. So um, I'm not sure that, that that kind of person is changeable. You have to want to learn and get better. Sometimes I get people come to me and they're sort of hit the low. They've hit it. Some, some of the people have gone to Sam and I know so many stories because Sam has told us so many stories about different, he's worked with hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of businesses at this point. So he'll tell us stories about people that have, their businesses have gone through fires. Their businesses have gone through floods in New Orleans. Their businesses, um, tornadoes have torn them down. Their businesses have had, people, teachers um, um, arrested for sexual abuse. And when you're in a kid business, that's a little serious, obviously. So there's so many, and sometimes people come to them in desperation. My business is going to fold. And so um, I didn't go to Sam in particular, and I didn't really know I needed a coach. It wasn't like I had a successful business. I've been, I was a su successful professional musician. I had a successful business. I've been successful in most things I've attempted and, but I'm open-minded and open enough to want to learn and continue. So when Leah said, Hey, what do you think? And I said, we both said, well, let's try, you know? And so by being open-minded, that's how my company went national. That's how I've gotten into um, uh, certain organizations and people say, well, how did this happen? I said, it was a 30 second email, but I did, but I did the work. I sat and then I went, Hey, I'm going to email this guy because this sounds sort of cool. And all of a sudden it opens up a door, that door leads to another place. So you always want to be in that mode of um, learning. So I didn't specifically think I needed a coach. Now, when I help people and, and coach, I explain those things of why, what coaches can do. They can fast track you, they can help you avoid mistakes, they can make you money quicker. Um, they can be a support person, they can help you, guide you. I don't, I'm, not, I'm never like, a, oh, do this and do this and do this, and I don't have some kind of worksheet. Everybody is individual. I have people that are um, high-end people in New York, high-intensity people in New York, people in the South, uh, women, men, different age groups, different, um, everybody's personality is different. And so you can't have this one program that you say, oh, if you do this, this is going to happen. But it, it, um I have this one slide in a presentation about input and learning. And um, it says, we're, it's good news and bad news. The, the great news is that we have an immense amount of bail, ability to learn at this point. We have the internet and YouTube and conferences and websites and uh, um, coaches. And I mean, there's like Inc. Magazine and books. I mean, there's a million places to learn at this point. Of course, that's the bad news too. It's because you could spend your life you could sit on YouTube for 18 hours searching stuff or websites or whatever, right? So how do you know what to do? And, and um, I talk about curating down of like how to learn, what you can learn. And, and coaches, I've read enough books and been involved in that for so long that I can guide a young person or a new entrepreneur to say, hey, start with this book. Start, and I want you to follow this guy. And I, cause I follow different guys and I know who 
probably the better ones are to do. So they fast track. So instead of somebody having to figure out, well, I, well, I could listen to um, Darren Hardy or Tony Robbins or Gary Vaynerchuk or this guy or this guy or all the Facebook things that I get on entrepreneurism. And because I've sort of gone through some of those people and I started listening to Tony Robbins 30 years ago and he had those thick books and books on tape and all that stuff. And so I sort of get Tony's deal or whatever. And um, so I can help guide them. So many people, a lot of people will say, well, have you ever heard of this guy? No. I said, write that name down. I, I want you to listen to him a little bit or I want you to follow this person. And um, w when you're by yourself, nobody told me to follow Tony Robbins or, or Darren Hardy or whoever. You know, I'd go to the bookstore in those days and I'd see Success Magazine or Entrepreneur Magazine and I'd buy them because I was into it. I wanted to learn. So I figure out who Darren Hardy was or who whatever. But a lot of people, I'm, you know, you can help, again, guide that and fast track people's stuff. So I saw them on the idea how coaches can really help a lot. They can help your learning and your finances and a lot of other things. Is there anything else that we want to hit in coaching? Anything I didn't ask you? Well, I'll hit on a few things. One is to be skeptical. I'm a skeptical guy. I'm a, you got to sort of show me uh, because there's so many people selling and hustling at this point. And, and I tell people even, you know, uh, let me come back to that slide about all the information. Most of those things that, that I mentioned have some kernel of truth in them. They're not, somebody writes an article in Inc. Magazine, it doesn't mean it's all false when you're skeptical or wrong. But, so there are some truths in there, but they may not be right for you. They may not be right for your personality, for your age, for your morals, for your ethics, for your finances, for your family life. So while this article, because you know, people come to me and they're like, oh, I read this article in this magazine that says, uh, entrepreneur, I should be doing this, I should be doing this. I said, well, here's a perfect example. I said, so, that is that really right for you? Like, you know, because that article might have been written from this perspective or for this. So you need to, you know, we talked at one point at some time about know thyself, you know, knowing yourself. So you have to figure out what's right for your passion and what's right for your energy, from your emotions, for your physical ability. I mean, there's all kinds. Of, so when you have all that input, you got to curate it. You got to be skeptical and say, and I tell them, be I said, the re I talk a lot in, in stories. And the reason I, I like to do that when somebody will say, well, I think it should be like this. I said, well, let me give you a story about that and what this could look like. And I give them practical examples about what can happen or what that looks like of, of stories that are factual that I actually know. And they go, oh, I see now. Because if you just say, don't do this or do this, it's like, it has, that has, everybody can say that you know, you got to sort of, I don't want to say prove it to them. And that's my way of showing them that I know what I'm talking about, because I can say, I, you know, I have a friend that this went through and this is what happened and this is why it happened. And I can illustrate it by a story. And I think that's a good way to teach. Um, so well, and what I like about that is you talk about curating information, curating what you learn and maybe looking at somebody else and trying to curate appropriate to them maybe what they need to know is you're contextualizing the situation you're contextualizing the person because if 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 i look at um uh, a coach and what they're telling me and and it's it sounds wonderful and it's amazing and it's great but you have to have fifty thousand dollars to get started doing what he's what he's telling me i don't have fifty thousand dollars to do that so contextually, right. it doesn't work. So right. you know, we, we need to have um, a good picture of who we are and, and, and what our situation is to really utilize education. You know, I mentioned that I'm really good at um, questions and the thing. I'm also really good at looking at the future, is seeing the end result of this. So um, I could see that if you do this, and I, I used to do that in our staff meetings, where we have a bunch of teachers, we have a staff meeting, we're trying to solve a problem or look at something to improve something. And somebody says, hey, you know, why don't we do this? And it, we're looking at a specific example. And I said, well, you know, we talked a little bit about it, excuse me, and, and um, I said, well, look, this, is, this may solve this here, but if we do this, what happens when this happens and this happens and a year from now we have this? 
And I said, we can't do that. And they all go, oh yeah, because this, this answer is going to lead to a problem here, lead to a problem here, the problem is going to be way bigger. So we'll solve this one in a, in a decision that's not good overall for the long-term situation. We have to solve this decision for everybody in the company, not just a singular person. So um, examples of what people read and come to me with. So everybody reads stuff in books about when you start your company that um, you really should get an accountant and you should get in, you know, fix your money and make sure your taxes and everything. And I, I, I really internally bristle at that when I hear that. I want to, so they go, you know, they, they're interviewing me to coach or something. And, and they say, well, you know, I was told that, uh, you know, I read that uh, I really should get an accountant to help do this and get an attorney to help do this. And, um, you know, set up for my taxes and everything. I said, I said, let's talk about this for a minute. I said, and I try not to be too harsh, but I say, do you know when you pay taxes? And they go, and it's sort of a quizzical thing. And they go, what do you mean? I go, you only pay taxes when you've made profit. I said, you don't have, and I want to, this is what I want to say, but I don't. I said, you don't have Jack. I said, you got an idea. You're like years away from making any money and you worry about paying taxes. You may lose money for the next three years. Let's worry about paying taxes when you've actually made profits, you know, because it, it, seriously, it's like, you're talking about taxes, you haven't made anything. Like that's not, you need to figure out how to take your idea to fruition and actually sell it to somebody that wants to buy it, you know? And it, is, it isn't, you know, I said, so we have about a thousand steps here to build a product, to make sure the profit margin is right. You can, you know, there's three steps I was told a long time ago to be an, a successful entrepreneur. One is you have to come up with an idea. Next is you have to be able to execute it and produce whatever that is. And then you gotta be able to sell it or profit. And if you don't get to the third one, you don't have anything. You don't have a company, you know, and I, there's a, a entrepreneur roller coaster books on my shelf. There's a page that I put a mark in and it says, you don't have any, you don't have a business until you've sold something, you know, and you don't have to worry about taxes unless you've sold something and made a profit. So these guys, but see, they're putting, I, I always go to the end, what the result in a way you want and, and, and that they want to start like, Oh, I need to build a website and I need to get this. I need to get my product. I said, well, if you sort of figure out like what this is going to cost and what you're going to sell this for and how you're going to sell it, and if you can sell it, let's talk about all those aspects before we start talking about hiring a limit purring an accountant. I said, we'll get to that later. Buy, buy QuickBooks and start working at it. You know, don't <laughs> hire, you know, and go to legal zoom and, and do your corporation really cheaply instead of hiring a $500 attorney to set up your corporation. You know, well, what's legal zoom? Have you ever heard of Upwork? No. Have you ever heard of this? No. Okay. Well, let me walk <laughs> It's, you know, it's like, okay, let me walk you through this. So, um, well, and that's a great example of a coach giving you a bump. It's like, hey, I'm going to bring you up to speed quickly. Uh, you can use these services as opposed to using these services. And you don't need this yet, but you need this. Right, right. And, and you got to figure out how you're going to make money. I mean, money is the, you know, and I don't mean to be crass about that, but money is the total driving thing that if you don't have money, you don't have a business. You can have all the dreams in the world. And, 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 you, and my, niece's, my niece and her husband in Nashville decided to open up a CBD store. And uh, a few years before that, we went down to visit them and we were talking and um, they're both uh, really Christian people. And uh, her husband, we were walking and talking and he was, we were talking about business. And I said, people have this, negative or emotional attachment to money. I said, and, oh, he makes a lot of money, probably whatever, however he made it. I said, it, I said, Josh, I said, you're really involved with the church. I said, if you had a successful business or a more successful business, you can give more money to your church. You can do great things with money. You can help, you're involved with the teen club. They're always trying to fundraise. You can give more money to your team club. You can give more money to the, to your outreach programs, right? And he never forgot that. He reminded me of that a few years later. He goes, when we were talking about business, he goes, you know, I didn't connect those two things. 
that the more money I made, the more I could help people. Yeah. And you know what? Unless you create a successful store that stays in business and sells product at a profit, which, you know, and that's why I, when I mentioned not being crass, I, I'm coming to the chase. You can't help your teen club unless your business is successful and you make money. What you do with your money, Sam has a thing about guilt in that, which is really cool. He, for every $10,000 he makes, he donates to an organization that plants a, a well in Africa for fresh water, which helps many, many people. And he said, he said, I just, he said, that releases you from any guilt about making money and making a lot of it because I am helping people, you know, and he, he didn't say this, but he could look around the room and go, so how many people here are planting wells in Africa right now, helping thousands of kids and like everybody be like, <laughs> you know, like that. I mean, not, I'm being extreme with that, but sure. you know, but you know what I mean? It's like, so you don't have to have associate guilt or bad things with money, you know, the filthy lucre and they, there's all kinds of bad phrases about money. Um, it, well, let me another, ask you this. Yes. Yeah. Um, since we're talking about money and we're talking to artists, why do you think artists struggle so much with money? And why do you think they struggle with charging for what it is that they do, the service they provide creatively? Yeah, um, it's, it's a, it is a tough thing. For so long, the, the narrative has been the starving artist thing. Um, and, and that gets in people's head or the idea that they're selling out um, their art, and which there's, those are all false. Those are just things that are implanted in them that um, it, being an artist, it can be a tough business. There's no doubt about it. A lot of people um, don't make money at it, but there are ways to make money at it and be successful at it and be an entrepreneur. But, but it's, nobody says it's going to be Rose Garden, man. Nobody said you weren't going to have to bust your rear end for a long time. Not only at selling your art and marketing yourself, but being good at it. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about, you know, like people come to and say, you know, I, I, like, you know, I've been doing this podcast for a really long time, or I've been doing this, uh, you know, YouTube videos for a really long time. And he looks at me and goes, well, maybe you suck at it. And it's like, seriously. And he's, and he's a really nice guy and he's really straight ahead, but he's really honest. So maybe, maybe, um, maybe YouTube isn't for you, but you write really well. Okay. Maybe, maybe you don't talk so well. So podcasts aren't for you, but something else is. So, so, self-awareness again like maybe you're not that good an artist uh, seriously you know so you you got to be self-aware or maybe you're an artist at a certain level or maybe you um you, you can there are so many there's there, if you if you google like ways to make money in in music or the music business there's a thousand ways from if you're a violin player more than likely you're not getting in chicago symphony and I don't say that as a mean way, but the odds of you playing in the NBA or NBA are probably pretty damn low also, right? So, but if you were into sports, you're not making it the NBA. You may not probably make it on your college team either, but can you go to school and be involved in sports medicine? Can you go there and be involved in sports marketing? Can you go there and be in sports concessions? Can you, can you um, in sports accounting? You know, in sports, being an agent, you could be around sports your whole life. Can you go into minor league teams and, and help with the King County Cougars and be around baseball players? Something you really loved as a kid. Can you still be in that? So you don't have to, there's, it's not black and white. It's not zero or everything. You're not going to make the NBA and you're not going to make the Chicago Cubs. But between that, are there, are there thousands of jobs in the NBA or or those kind of things. Are there thousands of jobs in music, whether it's tech, whether it's um, my son just texted me last night. There's a we had a Zoom call with our family, and all my family is all professional musicians. And um, Brittany, my daughter in LA, posted a thing about um, her friend being a Red Rock. I guess Red Rock is a really famous rock and roll venue in Colorado or somewhere out there. And um, Nick, my son in New York, said, "Hey, my friend, my good friend Mark." is working with this group at Red Rock at that concert this weekend. So while Mark is a really good musician, 
He's not playing there as a musician, but he's involved with the tech and guitar support for this big name act, whatever it was. So Mark is still enjoying himself, still involved in the music business, still making a living, but he's maybe not the one on stage. Maybe he's the one at the tech board, or he's the one selling concessions, he's the one doing the lighting, or he's the guitar player that goes out and tunes all the guitars and has them set up ready to go. Is he the guy setting up, you know, who knows, maybe he's driving the truck, you know, to the next gig. But, but you know, but that's a way to stay in, in an industry or a passion you love without maybe, your art may not hang in the Art Institute, sorry, pal, you know, and I, don't, I would never say that to somebody, but you know, but if, if you're not going to have an art in the art institute, can you do murals? Can you do marketing, work for a marketing agency or whatever? And that's where, but some people feel that's selling out or they feel it's, it's degrading their art in some way and they have to get over that. Um, you know, they just have to get around that. And that's what I would push on them. Yeah, it, it's interesting because you know, you've you you've intimated this earlier when you talked about the the lady that you said, "Hey, nobody nobody's coming," and she broke down into tears. I mean, there's a lot of emotions. Well, we're human beings, so there, there's a lot of emotions. Period. Even if somebody says, "Ah, I'm not emotional," well, okay, yeah, no, that's, but yeah. it just means you're not really aware of it, and. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there is uh, a lot of emotion around our hopes and our dreams from when we're young. And, uh, you know, we add expectations to that. And then, you know, you may have a, a mom or relatives or family who say, oh, you're the best. Well, and you're the only artist they know. So there, you know, you got to take a look at that. <laughs> right. And there, there's just a lot that goes into it. Um, and then if you're willing to be if you're willing to be pr pragmatic and teachable, again, things that we've talked about, <laughs> you, you have, you have a, an opportunity and a chance, or I should say you have a chance to catch the opportunities that come your way, as opposed to saying, I'm only going to be successful if I show at the Art Institute. I'm only going to be successful if, well, you're really limiting your chances. Right. It, 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 oh, I have so many stories. I could, I could go on for a million hours. The, the, my, the first year I went to see, there was a, a woman artist who was a piano player, a classical player. I don't know if you remember her. Jade. Jade. Yeah. So Jade, Jade tells a story that I, I knew the ending when, I, when she got about 10% into it. So, because I've seen it in, in our industry. So Jade's uh, the best player in a town. I always call it Iowa, but I think she was from you know, some small town, doesn't matter. So not a major market. So she says, I'm a great piano player. I win all these awards. I'm really good. Um, and she was, uh, you know, well-spoken and beautiful. She was, didn't she do pageants and stuff? So the reason yeah. I'm saying well-spoken is if you do pageants, they, you really have to speak well, right. and have great poise. So she's got it all going on. Her presentation so, was excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So, she says, uh, she goes, so, you know, this best player in my county or whatever the heck it is. So she gets a scholarship. She goes to Northwestern. So as she said that, I went, I know the end of the story perfectly. So, and I'm paraphrasing for her, but she, she goes, I get to Northwestern. I'm a, and Northwestern is a phenomenally high end music school. I'm one of the best in the country. Taught uh, the, all the teachers there in the music school are from the Chicago Symphony, Lyric Opera. Um, that sort of thing. So, and the people that go there are from all over the world as some of the best young artists in the world. So she goes to Northwestern, she's walking down the hall and she hears this unbelievable practice room, you know, everybody's practicing practice rooms, unbelievable piano playing. And she goes, oh, must be one of the professors like warming up and stuff and puts her head in there as a freshman. Walks down the hall some more, she hears this other thing that's like just, uh, you know, just unbelievable freshman. And then and the light bulb goes off for her. Oh, there my, my, I had a teacher, and I'll continue the story, big fish in a little pond. She was a big fish in a little pond. You can be the best player in the middle of Iowa, but try, try going to New York City. Okay? And that's how, and that, unfortunately, that's how this business is. The kind of teachers you have, the kind of training you have creates a lot of times 
an end result. So she gets there a real, and, and her dream was to become a classical pianist, traveling the world, playing Carnegie Hall and concert venues, right? So she gets there and realizes, oh, there's no, that's, you know, she comes to the realization that's not happening because the kids that are playing in there probably started two years old, probably studied in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago with high-end teachers, went to the best uh, youth symphonies, et cetera, and they get fat and could have had parents that were professional players for all she knows. Her, her dad could have been a farmer for all we know. You know, and the reason I say that is my kids are all high-end professionals, but they came from two parents that knew the business, knew the teachers, knew the kind of instruments, knew the places to go to find the high-end stuff. So my kids were, I don't want to say fast-tracked, but, but between their natural ability and people that knew how to guide them, it's almost like having your own coach from young, could do that. So because of that thing, so, so there's a positive part of this. So she, um, she realizes that she's not going to be a concert pianist on stage. She's not going to Carnegie Hall. That's just not, it's not, it's just like somebody, some really good, if you're the best basketball player in Iowa, still may not you're probably not making the nba you know it just just doesn't matter so i mean the odds are, are incredibly low so one day she's practicing and she's likes rapping and she's doing these rap lyrics and her husband goes man you're really good at that you want to you want to write some rap songs and stuff and she thought about it and she goes i am sort of good at this and she decides to write some of these cool rap tunes along with her playing and um she ends up and between her intelligence and eloquent speaking and her piano playing classical playing which is fantastically good and her ability to do some rapping she created a whole speaking and playing uh not persona but career where now she does play large cool venues playing and singing but not brought in as a classical pianist of the highest order but someone that does a unique thing that's really cool so notice how that you you know it, her dream from when she was a kid and every kid thinks they're going to be a basketball player a baseball player or, or a lead guitar player in a rock band or whatever but that usually doesn't happen so but because she had these great skills and was open-minded and saw what this looked like, she still is doing a beautiful thing and has a great career and is making money and enjoying herself and helping people all wrapped into one great package. That's the kind of story. And when I said you could, you don't have to have an art institute, but there's a lot of other cool things that you can do within your industry um, or within your love and passion. And Jade was Man, I, I've told that story a million times, but that is a perfect example of what musicians can do, you know, because you're not making it in the symphony, but that's okay. There's a lot of the things, my daughter was a fantastic classical player, but she's playing with the biggest artists in the world in LA. She's playing Coachella. She was on the, um, she was on the Academy Awards with Eminem, you know, stuff like that. And, but she sort of grew up as a classical player, but she loves the other stuff and so you know i mean how phenomenal is that to see like 50 million people on tv when you work with eminem or playing at coachella in front of fifteen thousand people and the sun's going down with a huge artist pretty cool you know not quite maybe what she thought of but she's real happy yeah and so you prepare for those opportunities you prepare, you keep on going, going forward, and, and maybe you're walking down the hallway of that college going, uh-oh, that, that's what I want to do. I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. Uh-oh, there's somebody else. There's so many people. And then all of a sudden, you mix a couple of different ingredients together, and opportunity presents itself, and, and you're actually doing something that you didn't even know you would love. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's like, you know, but it's so cool because that's having an open mind and learning and but being prepared and working hard i mean yeah. she still had to you know all those ingredients have to be you have to work hard you have to be open-minded you have to keep your skills up keep wanting to learn um and people i think 
um, you sometimes let that slide or they don't understand maybe hard work or, uh, you know, like what's involved. There's, yeah, it's funny because I, I dislike the word luck. Um, you, things just happen at certain times that you don't realize are going to happen. You know, like when you meet your wife, all of a sudden you didn't plan to go to 7-Eleven that day, right? And all of a sudden you did at that specific time. And who's walking out? and drops their groceries and you help them, whatever the story is. But you know what I mean? Had you gone 30 seconds earlier or later, you don't meet your wife. Is that luck? Is that, how, do, how does, you know? And so um, it, it's just an interesting, life is an interesting thing like that. But being prepared and working hard, nobody can, you may have not met your wife there, but you know, or your career in a, has gone in a certain way, but you, you should never regret working hard and pushing forward and be, you know, and learning. Because absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, well, that's where it's at. I mean, that's, you've got to have a foundation from, from which that you can, you can earn, right. <laughs> and be able to say when the opportunity arises, Hey, I can do that. <laughs> I'm your guy. Right. I'm your gal. Let me, let me at it. Right. So, exactly. So let's let's kind of segue then back into a mastermind. Tell me that that I've been hearing about masterminds for a long time. I've done a little research. You've been involved in them. Tell me mm -hmm. what 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 goes into being involved in a mastermind and or orchestrating one. You know, I never heard of the word mastermind until I got involved with Sam mastermind groups. I just didn't. You know, that wasn't a word that it probably also wasn't as prevalent 15 years ago as it is now. But um, I think masterminds are phenomenally good. I do think they're, um, I get a little nervous sometimes because let's say, because I'm thinking like you can buy into certain masterminds or there are like people that hold mastermind groups online um, that you buy into saying, oh, if you're, you know, if you're a middle-aged guy at this age and you're looking for blah, 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 we have a great group or whatever. Um, our mastermind came about through Sam's organization, which was nice. I went to Sam and actually I was the one that approached him. I said, Hey, are there any other, because we would meet twice a year, maybe at the most. Um, and then all those people would be there and then you'd sort of wouldn't see him or hardly talk to him. So I asked him, I said, who else in our area would be good for us? And at that point he sort of knew my personality, but he goes, you know, you should talk to, this person and this person, oh, and talk to her, and uh, and uh, those would be good people. So, you know, I went around the tables, I introduced myself, and we exchanged information, and then we set up our group. And uh, within those groups, you find people that are that are stronger and weaker. Some people that are um, leader types and not leader types. And uh, there were two of us that were leader types that would create an agenda and email everybody saying, hey, we're meeting here, we met at a place, and, and we would have an agenda. We would hold people accountable a little bit as best you could. You'd say, hey, why doesn't somebody bring in a book recommendation next time? Or, and one of the agenda items might be, come with your best marketing idea in the last month that you did. Come with your best tech idea, and, and come with your issues or problems. Um, and so we could all talk for hours and somebody would say, hey, I really have this problem with this parent or this the leaseholder or whatever that is. And we would exchange ideas and support them and try to help do that. Or somebody walk in saying, hey, I marketed this. It was phenomenal. And we went like, oh, that's great. Send me a PDF of that or whatever. So masterminds are really, really strong if you get the right people in them. And uh, you want to be with around successful people as best you can. There's that old saying about, you know, you're the sum of whatever. I'm not, those get, and there's a skeptic in me, those things get pushed around a lot and people buy into that. It, they're not always quite, um, there's accurate. usually some, some root truth in a platitude, but it's still a platitude. Exactly. Thank you. That's a great word. Yeah. Um, so I think the uh, uh, part of the, so I, if, if people were thinking about those, I would try to set them up with people that I thought would be strong and good for the group. And um, 
stay with an agenda. And sometimes it's hard to walk away from those. Sometimes they end up disintegrating on their own. Sometimes some people are too dominant in there. Um, so I don't know what else to say about it. I think they're really, well, really what, good. What would an agenda look like? Like say we were sitting in a mastermind right now. Mm -hmm. Are you guys meeting for an hour? Are you meeting for two hours? Are you, I mean, sure. we're in a different world right now, right? So we'd be Zooming. So, right. so what would? Well, we, we used to meet, um, we, we picked a central location. Two of them were from Wisconsin. Um, I, actually, three of them were from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And so we would drive up and meet around Schaumburg in the hotel. So, it was, so we would, um, I think we would meet at nine and um, go through lunch and end up with lunch. So nine to 12 um, on a Friday, like once a month. And it was nice because we were able to sit at big tables and we would have this agenda. So if we met at nine o'clock, you know, we, it might be that book recommendation or chapter. It might be somebody that came across some really good website that we should check out. It might be a marketing piece. Everybody, another thing that we did, I'm trying to recall because it's been a number of years, is that everybody got like five or seven uninterrupted minutes. Nobody else could talk. Even if you were dying to, to say something, it was like you had to go, you had to let her go seven minutes uninterrupted. And, that, and you could say anything you wanted. You could complain, you could complain hard about something you could. Uh, were, those, I, were those at the end of those five to seven minutes, were those open for feedback? Yeah, generally at that point, um, usually people would want feedback and when we had to be careful because you know you got a lot of strong people in there that that all want to talk and, and do those kind of things so it, it can run on those things can run on forever but um, that's where having a good moderator is saying you guys we've got to move on let's let's like in that because when you think if you had five people at seven minutes a pop plus let's say it took 15 minutes for that person you're you're right there you're an hour and a half if it goes a little bit, you know, of your, of a three hour meeting or something. So, um, so we, we, we had that segment. We, we uh, would try to bring marketing pieces um, that were helpful. Anything we learned through that last month, but there also was resolution. So if somebody had their seven minutes or their 15 minutes of this major problem, then we would all try to help and say, did you try this? Did you talk to this person? What does this look like? And then a month later, you would come back to that problem and say, hey, how did it work out? What happened with that? And they'd say, oh, it was all like this. This is what happened. It's still ongoing or whatever the case may be. So you always, you're, you're always, because, and once people understand everybody's business and what excuse me, they're doing, you you have an interest in it. And you say, hey, I know that you said, you know, it was always like the Monday morning diet thing. You know, it's like every, every Monday is a new diet. Like, okay, so we're a month later, how did the uh, Atkins thing go? You know, and then of course, it's some funny stuff, but we're being supportive in that and uh, um, learning. Oh, and sometimes it's connections. And sometimes if you're in the similar business or the same business, people say, hey, you should talk to this company because I got a really good deal on this, or this is how you should solve this. That, that is where it's so helpful to have people in your same industry we do a mastermind call now that Lee and I just got on with Sam's group. There's about 15 in there. They don't all show up on Fridays and we start them at one o'clock Chicago time. And of course, right now it's all about COVID and uh, mitigation circumstances. And, and th this is a good example. Like these studio owners are doing all kinds of cleaning methods. And they'll say, hey, we found this air purifier for all these small rooms. It's $89 on Amazon. You could buy five of them, put them in these rooms. So another guy will say, we're doing a whole studio thing where we're buying these kind of filters and putting them in our furnace or our air conditioning unit, and that circulates the air like this. Other people say, hey, we found, where are you guys finding plexiglass shields, right? Because you're trying to teach in these rooms. How are you, figure, how are you doing microphones and disinfecting them? Well, how often? So now you have like 10 people that are all smart and on it and the amount of information that goes in there how did you get well you guys are doing a recital at the end of the year a, a music recital how did you do that with 15 kids oh we use this technology we did this how did you do the microphones how are you doing dance lessons because you have all your mirrors but the dancer is backwards right so when the dancer does this on zoom it looks like this to a kid there's there's a thousand things that 
we discuss and try to solve within our own industry. So you can imagine how helpful, how we're doing stuff that uh, the acceleration curve in that, because everybody's trying to accomplish the same thing. But and these people, like I said, Alaska, LA, San Francisco, you know, East Coast, they're from all over, but, um, and, but they're smart and they're on it. So you don't have to, like, if I needed something to solve within that business, I was in a mastermind, uh, you know, like a couple of days before I'd say, Hey, you guys, I want to talk about this because I don't get this. And, um, and all of a sudden somebody comes out, Oh, you need to buy this microphone, but you need to set it up like this. You're going to get feedback from that. So it has to go through zoom first, then into the amplifier, and then it needs to go to those speakers there. And then you got it and buy this cable on Amazon. For, you know, it's like, okay, I didn't have to learn all that because he spent 18 hours or he's way better at that at tech than I am. You know, or here's the marketing piece you use. They all tried to start new businesses called um, Learning Bubbles. Everybody was into that. So now you have a bunch of locations of there's nobody in them. So now that school is starting, parents need help. So it, it didn't end up flying, but they all created Learning Bubbles, marketing pieces, what the schedule will look like, how much you were going to charge, who was going to teach them, are they going to have, is it going to be tutoring or is it going to be, um, just babysitting, how are you going to do the safety things for the kids? What age group are you doing? There's a million things to do. Now, now it's all there. So what's awesome about that is, is it's a practical application from people who have made the mistakes and have the answers in, in a group think. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. really good. It how is. would you go about starting a, a mastermind? What goes into it? You know, you know, I, I thought about this after we sort of finished up with Sam and that grouping that, that I think, you know, I, I had some thoughts that maybe dissimilar businesses, maybe dissimilar, but within the same type, like service businesses, like um, there are so many similar things. The reason I coach a bunch of different businesses, there's so many similar things. So you could have somebody with a yoga studio and a dance studio and a cleaning service um, and, and maybe two or three other types of businesses and create this mastermind out of that where somebody's approach in marketing and a cleaning business could actually apply to this, right? And um, somebody's approach to hiring or interviewing, which, has, which is a skill, um, it could be much better and say, here's how we usually hire. We have two different people do them. We have to do different times. We look at this. And so I, I think that starting a mastermind, you could look at dissimilar, similar businesses. Like you could do them. If you did a mastermind with artists, for instance, it, you don't have to have all musicians. You know, you could have musicians, you could have artists, you could have, but because you're all sort of selling a service and that sort of thing. Um, and boy, I find it scary to approach people that you don't know. But I, but I'm, for me, I'm, I enjoy talking to people all the time, and I'm really, I get a sense fast. Like if I'm going into a a restaurant that I know somebody owns, and it's really well run and really good, and it's been there a long time, and I happen to start talking to the owner and seeing he's a really cool guy and stuff. Maybe he's a guy who say, you know what, you know, I know you've been in business a long time I, and he learns what kind of business you have and that you're successful. You say, would you be interested in getting together for coffee or a mastermind group or maybe two and you do and you like each other's company and it's really strong. Say, you think we should start a mastermind group? Are there any other business people you know? Um, there's, you can go to Chamber of Commerce things and meet. Chamber of Commerce is basically all business people. Um, I suppose it would, you'd, you'd want to vet it somewhat so that you didn't yeah. have like a loose cannon or two in the group. Right. And you don't want to have people to just take. Right. That's the other thing that, that people show up and like, you know, the, one of the lines we've read and talk about the smartest guy in the room thing, you know, you're in the wrong room, but um, <laughs> you do want people that will contribute. Yeah. You know, you don't want slackers in there. I mean, it's, it's unfair to have, two of the five that really are on top of things and bring in new stuff and everything and everybody else is taking notes. It's like, 
now if I do that, I got to charge you. <laughs> right, right. You probably find out pretty quick. Oh, that's yeah, hard. and then and then how do you dump them? Right. That's what that's what that's what bothers me is that I don't like that aspect. Um, or you end up having to bail yourself, saying, you know, I just don't. I think I I don't have the time. As you sort of try to get out of it gently, but um, it, I, I think it's a tough. I, I think it can be a tough thing. We we attend C together, and you pretty quickly when you run into people in these conversations, you know who you're compatible with, you know, who, um, in your mind, you think is smart and on it that you can learn from, uh, yeah. you know, you know, that you should be involved in organizations and stuff. You might run into people at your church or your kid's ball game or somewhere, um, that again, be open-minded, you know, yeah. see successful people. Opportunistic. Right. Yeah. You keep your exactly. eyes open. That's cool. Right. And so as uh, as we wrap up, Jim, thanks so much for sharing everything you did. So appreciative of of all the insight uh, and great stories and whatnot. What like one or two pieces of advice might you have for the artist who is looking for a coach or now they're interested in a mastermind? What do they need to do? A lot of people go to colleges these days, go to college. So one of the things you could do is start with college friends or people that you have gone to college with if you're older, that you admired or thought were good. Um, There are people at your college that were professors that you admired and liked and thought were good. So you start you know, the Fraser Kingdom, I was beating the bushes, but you start, you start working on it. You start ma- making calls and emails and saying, hey, you know, you know, uh, you're looking for connections that you think are right, I guess. So uh, I guess, and I always use Google for a lot of stuff. I mean, you could, you could just Google masterminds in my area, service business masterminds or things like that. You just don't know where one email or one link is going to lead to somebody else. You could even use things like LinkedIn to start searching, those are those are a bit peripheral because, but you can't discard them, you know. Like um, because there, there you could just run across something. I mean, like okay, so I live in Plainfield, so I might Google Plainfield Naperville Mastermind Groups. See what comes up. There'll probably be about fifty pages of something. That you, that you can scroll through and you go, hey, these guys are meeting here. You know, it might be, hey, come join us. We meet at a restaurant every third Thursday evening and we talk about this business or whatever. So, and even if that doesn't work out, say you call or email that person, say, hey, you know, I'm looking for this. I don't know if this is right. Any suggestions? And people are more than happy to help you. So that guy may say, I want to say, this isn't probably right for you, but I know another group or I know this person right so it just keeps that's how those things always i don't want to say unravel but they they trail you know it's like a spider web thing and one person turns you on to another so starting with google and starting with that kind of thing in your area um thinking about other if you're if you're an artist that's i think different than being a, a business entrepreneur even though they're the same thing um on the artist side of your musician or artist, you got to find places where they hang out and talk and do stuff. And I don't, not being an artist, I don't, I'm sure they're, they're, they're around. People go, oh, those things don't exist. And the first thing I think is that's bull. They exist. You yeah, just got to out there. They're out there. There's no doubt yeah. that people are hanging out. And if, and if they're not, maybe it's up to you to start. Maybe you post something on Google or somewhere. Where you say, I'm an artist looking for this. I mean, is there a place to, to do that? Um, how many people are doing artistic things with um, Pinterest right now? And like millions, and you know damn well that there's people in your area that are on Pinterest that are good artists that are doing stuff, right? That are not doing what you're doing. One person's doing ceramics, another person's doing jewelry, another person is painting or whatever they're doing, but they're in similar genre sort of thing start tracking them down 
So I th I'd say general rule of thumb, you're going to pay for a coach. Um, do you pay for masterminds? No, not, a, not, well, you can, but I wouldn't, I think that you should, those should be, everybody brings their stuff and everybody does that. I think, yeah, so no, if someone, there are coaches that do mastermind groups and lead that and, and they get paid. I know a number of them. So those are out there and they're valuable because usually people that are the ones I know are good at it and successful. Um, but, but I, I'm not sure in the artist thing that that we're going to find that. So I would suggest no, not doing a paid thing um, and trying to create your own. Awesome. And don't, Jim. and don't, don't be bummed out by unsuccess, non-success either. First one may go bust. First one may be bad. Okay. So that, so that one didn't work. That doesn't mean the next one might not be great. Thanks again, Jim, for being my guest. Thank you for sharing such incredible information. So, so insightful and helpful regarding uh, coaching and masterminds and pricing, like why why artists struggle with pricing. We had a, a, a few different areas we went into and out of. I suppose something that really jumps out to me uh, from our discussion is you you have to be in charge of your own learning. You have to be in charge of your education. Uh, you have to be in charge of curating the information that's coming with you because it, it's not all going to be beneficial or pertain to you. So you need to know yourself. You need to know as best you can with all this, right, where you're going. And uh, yeah, it, it can be really challenging, but it, that's the thing that really jumped out at me. And I, I suppose something that I will often say to myself or share with friends is, is I need to learn how to learn. I've got to learn how to learn so that I can kind of pick and choose and keep what works for me. And then it really, it really kind of sorts itself out in action and application. Meaning, you know, you get to put your education to the test in, in the real world on the field, right? As, as you're trying to be successful in your business and in your art. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was one of my favorite interviews. Jim, Jim has such incredible information to share and he's, he's, uh, done so many things. And, you know, I just wanted to, uh, remind you and share with you that you can contact Jim in the show notes and you can reach Jim at, uh, so that's the email I started, right? Jim at James jconsulting.com. If you're interested in, in any coaching, Jim is available and uh, I couldn't recommend him more. So re really good guy. It'll be really helpful and I'm grateful for the info he shared. So I encourage you to consider uh, employing a coach, consider uh, going after a mastermind. Uh, it will benefit you. And as Jim said, be skeptical about about the person or the group that you're getting into because you you it's not that everybody's bad right but you need to figure out what works for you that's it for the breakthrough creative this week happy 2021 as i said at the beginning it's going to be a stellar new year and i wish you the best in all your pursuits and i hope that you are busy working on a plan and a path that is going to allow you to make a living from your creative work all right all right i'll see you next week cheers